All right. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get started. Um, so welcome to my talk. Uh, it's actually on getting approval, um, basically how to make a case for open daylight and how do you actually get executive approval within your organization. So um, I'm going to go over a variety of uh, things that should be considered. Uh, what can you do? Uh, we have a few tools and, and so on and so forth. Um, and before I actually do that, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Mathieu Lamey, CEO of uh, InnoSide Technologies. We're a pure play open daylight company. So we've been involved in the project since its uh, inception. So we've been very, um, uh, we saw all the iterations uh, and how it actually evolved over time. And we're aware of the good, the bad, and, uh, and the actual ugly. Uh, however, uh, open daylight has been uh, uh, deployed in, in production uh, more and more over the past, I'd say, last two, three releases, we, we're seeing more and more uh, real use cases. Uh, we're helping vendors do products out of it and so on and so forth. Um, therefore, we believe it's important to know exactly how one should be making the case uh, for proper approval uh, within their organization. I'm hoping to make this session uh, a bit interactive as well. I mean, so if you guys uh, have any questions, comments, are living some of uh, the issues yourselves, uh, I would love to hear you out and potentially give you any guidance I can uh, in order to help you um, may be the champion within your organization. So how do you actually start into um, uh, bringing open daylight in uh, your organization? Well, the, the first thing you need to come up with, I know it sounds obvious, but it has to come up with a, a strategy on how you will bring that internally. Um, you need to really design how you will be making the case, how you will be getting the proper approval, the proper budgets, and so on and so forth uh, in order to address that. So I'll, I'll go into details on on why um, and, and how it starts. So the first thing, it actually starts with a champion and most likely the champion is you. Um, <laughs> the champion uh, has to learn everything about the open daylight before the others. So you need to be able to digest everything you learn uh, around, the, uh, around the framework. We, what we saw in the um, the engagements is there's always that one key person that everyone refers to. And that person is the one that will have to roll the boulder uphill uh, within the organization. I know it's not easy uh, for most people we've been working with. It's always a huge um, internal debate, a lot of internal politics and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's why you guys are important. Um, you also need to have great communication skills, right? Uh, usually what we find is like, the deep technical people that know a lot about ODL or, or that have all the, the right knowledge sometimes will fail into getting the executive approval uh, required because of some communication uh, or more politics challenges within the organization. So communication skills are uh, essential. You need to have the right influence and reputation within the organization. So if it's not you, you basically need to have uh, all the polls in order to um, to make it happen and of course have access to the budgets. I know it kind of is the 101 and it's, uh, it's quite obvious, but I, I just wanted to lay it out there. Um, of course, it will take lots of preparation. It's gonna be a, a bumpy ride and you will have to be the go-to person. You need to be ready for the changes and you need to be able to fight with the processes that um, will, like, will be in either your procurement or some of the pr procurement challenges uh, where they will basically steer you to uh, either your typical vendor or an alternative solution or just getting into the whole PO process sometimes will be uh, uh, quite challenging. And so what we find is, what helps, and again, I apologize if that sounds like 101, but it's really to start with a business case. Too often do we see people just kicking the tires to understand the technology and, and know what to do with it. Um, usually that doesn't end up well uh, because when it gets into 
um, uh, more of the budgetary discussions, it gets down to how, like, where's, where's the money that I will save? What's the ROI? Why should we even go with that open source thing versus buying from their typical proprietary vendors? So that's why the business case and the actual savings, whether it's um, saving on the core network costs and through, through optimization by doing different types of flow management, or uh, it's actually just lowering the capex costs and so on. Uh, you need to have a strategy in order to make money. Just checking what it can do cannot um, solve it. So what, what are the common business cases or what, which ones do we see the most often? Um, We'd say that in the cloud environments uh, or in the data center slash cloud use cases, um, most of the business case is uh, geared towards a lower capex. So they will want, or most folks wants to lower uh, the cost of the gear that they're using because it's a massive scale data center environment. Therefore, the cost per port uh, becomes significantly important. So having a lower capex either through white boxes or um, uh, other cheaper controller alternatives, uh, the price point of uh, the solution becomes essential. Also, improving performance within the data center is uh, um, another key area. Just doing it from a, uh, when you're actually automating your cloud, you want to have the proper um, uh, scale and performance uh, that you want. So you, you will be uh, improving your performance between what you're currently doing. Either it's usually some, somewhat of a semi-manual process. So automation and orchestration are the ways that uh, one will uh, be trying to uh, get a significant uh, business case within the cloud environments. The other one or the other, I would say, area of business cases that we see is automation. Uh, basically net ops, right? So that one is fairly popular. We see it a lot in either campus networks, uh, SD-WAN use cases, and uh, what we see there um, and uh, the way they justify it is through emerging services. Sometimes it's more agility, so you want to be able to provision within a very rapid time frame in order to save costs, or you want to sell that new service to your customer at a premium, uh, give them the ability. So you're looking for revenue differentiation in that case. Um, and the agility and efficiency of uh, the network becomes a key component. So in this case, in this case uh, through automation, what you'll find is mainly OPEX reductions. Okay, so basically most folks will be looking at OPEX reductions to that regards. The last one, pretty much emerging, is the IoT one. So in IoT, it's all about security, like the hidden cost of security uh, within your organization. How much money is lost in some of the security. Security is always seen as an afterthought uh, <laughs> most of the time, uh, in, a, in, in, in cost and so on, but people um, will end up, uh, when they start looking at the numbers, this is a significant issue. The BYOD people with all their new devices, the iPhones, the, uh, um, the Android um, uh, devices and everything else are uh, bringing additional complexity and additional costs. Uh, so if you don't start automating with open frameworks, then uh, these costs are rising uh, within most organizations. Then there's the notion of visibility. What's happening? Uh, sometimes when you don't have the visibility, you're flying blind. And so there is a cost to flying blind for you, with your IT departments within the organization. And finally, you need to be able to come up with analytics around that, um, uh, that visibility in order to provide the right decision process uh, there. So why open source? So let's start about open source. You're here because, of course, you know about open daylight. You're probably already familiar with open source. Well, Open source is becoming today's architecture. Uh, of course, all many, many applications from cloud, database, computers, it's all powered more and more by open source. And network or open networking has been something that, of course, has been also exploding over the past three to four years. Uh, look at all the projects from the Linux Foundation, OVS, Fido, um, 
Onos, Open Daylight, Panda, all of these projects are uh, new open source projects, but they also increase the amount of complexity that people face when they try to deploy these solutions. It gets very, very complicated. How can you actually leverage these projects properly? What can you do with them? Uh, most customers that we are meeting today are a bit lost in all that ecosystem and, and that market because every tool ha are, are good at doing a specific job uh, more than others. So you'll find areas where a tool will perform well in a, in a particular use case and then how do you leverage that tool in another environment and what, how can you actually leverage these things properly is a big challenge within organizations and it's a challenge when you're actually trying to make a case uh, to your executives as well because they read the news, they look at um, the buzzwords and therefore it actually makes it a challenging thing. However, the good news is that um, open source is still in the on the climb. Uh, um, last year, most projects, uh, you had about like 60% people of uh, uh, surveyed individuals in the Black Dog survey uh, that were leveraging open source in one way or the other in their organization. And uh, now it rose to 65% this year. So it went from 60 to 65. So we see even more adoption of open source within the organizations today. And that is key um, into helping you make the case. Uh, look at AT&T, for example. John Donovan has really went forward and said that you wanted to use more open source in the solutions. They've been quite involved. Others are also following the same footsteps. There is a significant um, thing. And why is that important? Why is open source more strategic? Why would you even care compared to your proprietary solution? Well, for most people, uh, like in 2015, it was really People were not there for the same reason. 2015, it was the ability to customize and fix. That, that was kind of uh, one of the number one uh, thing. And uh, vendor lock-in freedom. So you didn't want to be stuck with this particular vendor. You wanted to have the ability to, to switch. Um, so that was kind of the second and then total cost of ownership. So how, like it was costing less. Um, 2016, uh, you'll find that most people are, are no, lo lo uh, no longer really considering TCO as the main factor. Uh, cost is important, but all the other advantages of open source are even more important. And, and when I say that, it's that freedom from vendor lock-in. You don't want to be stuck in a very long-term um, relationship. You want to have the ability to... Uh, to choose. You want to have the ability to change. Uh, the quality of the solutions. So open source can provide a more targeted solution for the business case that we've mentioned before. You know, when you're doing a product as a vendor, you kind of try to fit everyone's needs. So you want to go to the 80-20 rule and solve 80% of the problems. Um, with open source, if that 20% is important to you, you actually can go and get it and add it yourself. And that actually ties into that ability to customize and fix, right? So these um, strategic advantages to open source is what makes it appealing. And that's a tool that you can use in order to make that case to your executives when you're talking about um, uh, open source. So. Open Daylight, what's Open Daylight? Of course, if you're here, you already know that. And um, uh, why is it important though? And why it is uh, a big open project uh, umbrella? Well, today Open Daylight has about 6 million lines of code, 3.4 million lines of code of that are like more the core pieces. Uh, and it is, it can be turned into pretty much whatever you want, right? And so um, uh, for us, we've been cooking recipes and helping people leverage it in a variety of different ways. And um, the recent SDX Central report as of two, three weeks ago, um, basically, if you look at the result, what open source solution people are considering for their network um, uh, or deploying today, sorry, um, is 61%. What are they considering from a deployment perspective? 
would be between, it's closer to 65% for open daylight. So open daylight is definitely the de facto community that people are turning to from an open source perspective. That doesn't mean it's perfect, but that actually means that there is critical mass and people are there and they care about the project enough to go and fix the issues that exist within the community. Um, don't know if you saw this uh, uh, also end user survey or power user survey that came out earlier this year. I think it was in the February um, time frame. Uh, if you look at the demographics on how people are leveraging open daylight today, it, it really varies. Um, it, the ecosystem vendors, people doing products out of open daylight, I must say that that's that was the first wave, like most, um, and I, I say that looking also at our customer base at, at InnoCybe, um, what we find is that the vendors were the first to adopt it. They were creating a variety of products, whether it's an SDN controller, an SD-WAN controller, an IoT controller, um, networking agents, uh, things that are leveraging into devices. So they pick and choose each of the sub-projects. There's 82 of them today in Boron. Um, so they pick and choose the pieces that they care about and they turn it into a variety of products, right? So that's how they leverage Open Daylight today. They let the flowers bloom, take the technologies they care about and turn that into uh, products. Service providers um, are also a very significant uh, you know, adopter of Open Daylight. Uh, I'd say They've been using it more in labs, kicking the tires, making proof of concepts, uh, but uh, slowly deploying in production uh, pieces here and there in sub-projects. So usually it's about doing an internal project, solving a business case, as I was mentioning, and then um, deploying that into production. And what they like about the framework is that it's always the same uh, ecosystem or it's always the same uh, pieces of the stack. If you look at what are the pieces of the stack they care about, it's OpenStack, Open Daylight, uh, now, now newly uh, FIDO is, is getting quite popular, um, and then so the and OPNFV is kind of the testing and integration uh, environment for this. So these pieces of the stack, people want to kind of gravitate around uh, communities that will allow them to provide innovation, but with less risk, right? So why did you want to have that vendor lock-in or like why is open source so good is um, uh, the fact that you're kind of lowering the risk. Some of the customers that we're working with, uh, we've, we're quite involved in data utilities for cities, smart city uh, type of use cases. And for these guys, we're talking like a 25 year investment into infrastructure. So think of it when, as a, the fifth utility, you know, like the data. And so what you're doing is you want to lower your risk. You don't want, for example, InnoCyber to be bought out by whomever um, and then closing that technology and making it uh, under different terms and so on. That's a huge and significant risk. And you see a lot of that uh, in the ecosystem. For example, in the domain 2.0, TLF got bought by Cisco and so on and so forth. Uh, very similar story where some folks were not as happy with the, 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 new, um, the, the new model there. So by going open source, you actually can change vendor or you can change strategy if uh, the, the actual partner you have or if anything happens with your partner, right? Um, then there's the research and education networks. These guys have been leveraging more uh, uh, white box, lower cost equipment, open flow devices, high performant uh, um, open flow boxes, FPGA bays, and so on and so forth. And have been pushing the limits of some of the use cases that we find today. So they are also big leveragers of um, open daylight. In the enterprise market, what we're seeing is uh, financials. Uh, so the financials are now starting to get uh, interested and also um, uh, the cloud, large enterprise, Fortune 500 with their own cloud environments are, are uh, turning to open daylight for their NFV or cloud um, functionalities. So that's what we're seeing, but that's again on the enterprise side, I think the tip of the iceberg, just pretty, uh, uh, 
a bunch of newcomers, and uh, we're seeing more and more as the months go by. So why am I telling all you all this? Is It's basically because one good thing when you're making a case to your management for Open Daylight is to say, look, these guys are doing it, or these guys are doing it. If you need references, feel free to reach out. We can put you in touch with other customers or uh, people that are using it in production. So I'd be glad to do that um, to help you out if you're trying to make a case with your management. Um, so what it comes up to is just, just do it. Uh, so just get started with it. But you need to do it right. So once you've done the strategy, once you've actually made the case, uh, told your management, okay, these guys are doing this and it's working for them, they're doing that, uh, they're saving that much money and it's actually um, working, then you need to actually get at it and roll up your sleeves and get involved with uh, the project. But you need to find the approach you want to take. Um, what we found is sometimes uh, people are kind of doing a proof of concept that feels like a duct tape and, uh, <laughs> and straps holding the whole thing together. And while that is good from a proof of concept perspective, transitioning this to production environment means a full rewrite, uh, a lot of effort, and they sometimes will hit a wall within the management after that proof of concept. So um, we've seen that it's better to build incrementally around the solution and actually start with a solid foundation and then add layers and add more to it than just try to duct tape something that somewhat works uh, in the environment. And what we find is you need to find the approach you need, right? Are, are you doing everything in-house or do you want to off the shelf from your vendor type of solution or are you turning to your SIs? And so all these are good questions um, to ask yourselves when you're actually ready and engaged into uh, doing your open daylight strategy. If you look at the ecosystem players, where are people kind of positioned into that uh, environment? You'll see that uh, a lot of people are delivering open daylight based uh, products um, and are, are basically helping you out from a, uh, a product standpoint, solving the need and so on and so forth. Uh, then you have on the other side, um, of, like, of the coin system integrators like Ciro, uh, SDN Essentials. Here I just plotted the, the sponsors of the show. <laughs> so there's other players, but I, I started with the sponsors. Um, so you have the service folks, which uh, will give you a higher degree of customizability, like custom, uh, you can do a lot more custom uh, work around your uh, actual use cases because they're they're basically changing open daylight for your specific use case. Whereas the more rigid or product companies, they, I mean, that doesn't scale, right? So they kind of need to have a bit of that 80-20 rule in order to scale. And then you have the other ones, which are more of a, we have this rigid framework, we don't touch it, uh, but we provide services around it. So professional services around the rigid framework like uh, Brocade and the new startup uh, Franks are really um, uh, closer to that. Okay, we have this distro or we have this, just we sell support and, um, and then uh, it's up to you to kind of, uh, and we can provide services around that to do apps and so on and so forth. Um, for us, what we've done is more of a platform approach. So allows you to pick and choose, bake your open daylight distro to your specific use case or needs. So um, think of it more as a CICD or like full stack um, set of solutions that allow you to target a specific use case. So we provide custom, uh, uh, the ability to customize for your use case, uh, but we've taken more of a product approach for uh, scalability uh, purposes. So open daylight's no free beer. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, there's two things, right? When you say it's free, like open source or, or any open source project, it's, there's free as in beer and free as in a puppy, okay? So free beer, awesome. You drink it, it's, uh, it's great. Free puppy, uh, you have to always think twice about it, right? I mean, it, when you're actually getting a free puppy, not sure your wife will likely 
like it and, and so on and so forth. And you need to, have, to take care of that puppy. You need to really nurture it, make it grow, uh, and it, it will turn into something great. However, um, getting into uh, turning that puppy into the big dog <laughs> takes time, takes commitment. So Open Daylight also needs that level of co commitment. When you get to Open Daylight, don't expect a product. Don't expect something that's going to solve your problem day one. You need to really understand that it is a long-term commitment to the community, to the project. You'll get a lot of savings, a lot of uh, value out of it, but it is like a puppy. You need to uh, be aware of that, uh, like any other open source initiative. There is, and to that fact, there is an hidden cost to open source, right? So it is not only um, uh, there's a sweet spot on the curve. When you look at proprietary products, when you have low volume, they are and will always be cheaper, okay? Because just if you have a very small uh, environment, just getting an off-the-shelf solution is way cheaper than uh, going with your open source alternative because open source, you need to kind of uh, take care of it. You need competent people. You have the training. You have the people in-house. I mean, there's a lot of things around it in order to leverage it properly. However, whenever when you reach a certain um, quantity in your environment, uh, with multiple applications, multiple use cases, that's where the savings really hit, okay? That's it's really when you leverage it for multiple purposes and also, or a larger scale um, environment. So what are the kind of costs or the hidden costs of uh, open source? Well, basically acquisition costs or just license, usually it's, uh, it's low to none. So it's either you don't pay for license or you get it from a commercial distro at a lower margin or lower cost. So it's not too expensive. Uh, then you have, though, the training. Um, so you need, as I was saying, you need to train people in-house. And these people, you need to pay them. So you have your developer salary and the days of training. And these devs usually need a lot of uh, experience, especially when you're looking at a project like Open Daylight that has Yang knowledge requirements, good OSGI uh, requirements, Java requirements, um, uh, like advanced Java, not just uh, Java beginner uh, requirements. So the the first, the worst thing you could do is like put a co-op student on this. I mean that that's kind of the um, the the worst approach there. So you need to be uh, more of a senior slash advanced developer to be efficient within the open daylight environment. So that translates into cost and you need to be able to uh, justify that, that to your managers. Uh, maintenance and support, again, either you work with people like us or, or other uh, community members or you do it in-house, which means fixed cost salary, fixed cost for, of the internal experts. Um, and then you have the whole legal aspect to it, depending on, especially if you're a vendor building a product, you need to kind of know all the licensing risk and understand all the third party licenses um, that there are. And with Open Daylight, with 255 uh, dependencies, <laughs> at least, uh, third party um, dependencies and, and licenses, that gets uh, tricky. Um, and you don't necessarily want to package the whole world either. So one thing that our customers turned a lot uh, like on their vendor plan to us was the ability to create these little small customized distro that only has whatever they care about, not the whole world uh, with a bunch of legal liabilities. Um, so one thing that we uh, have been providing, and I, I honestly, I really uh, invite you guys to either reach out uh, to me, I would have put the link there, but uh, it wasn't up. But please reach out. We, we've created a ROI calculation tool. That, that's going to be very useful. If you're trying to make a case for Open Daylight inside your organization, we have created a, a financial spreadsheet that allows you to um, create a financial model on how much savings you get from Open Daylight. Uh, and that tool uh, will be available uh, for the community and, and so on, but I, 
please ask us uh, uh, either at the end of the conversation or just reach out on the website and we'll give you access. It's going to be announced shortly. Uh, it just we, we didn't have to, we didn't do the whole uh, legal process to, to open source it just yet. Um, so what are the common mistakes? What's the common mistakes people make? Um, well, the first thing I know I've been a bit of a, a pain on the whole business case thing and I need to bring it back. I, I see it so many times where people are just learning, right? And, and just learning is good. You, as a technology expert that you, you are, um, you need to be always learning. However, um, that works for a, simp like for a little while. And it, it actually will uh, work into getting some of that, making you a champion. However, uh, it will also mean that it will be hard for you to get like approval or, or budgets and so on and so forth. Uh, but you need to learn yourself, but just learning for the sake of learning usually is difficult. Another issue is um, when your manager comes to you and just said, I, I want SDN, right? I mean, that's like the worst thing that can happen because <laughs> there's no purpose to it. It's just that they've read about the buzzword, they want the new shiny object, but they have no clue what it does. And it actually, uh, to me, it's like a path towards the downward spiral. Um, and so you need to really see it as a tool in the toolbox and a means to solving a business problem. It, it, it's not just a technology change that you need to embrace, right? I mean, the, if you're do, doing it only for the technology, most of the time it, it's hitting a wall uh, because there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of uh, other things that need to be considered which will make uh, just a apple to apple swap uh, unsuccessful in, in many organizations. So the business case has to be there. They need to see the dollar sign. Um, again, like I said, it's not a product. It's, uh, it, you can't address it as a product. It's more closer to a custom software to some extent. So usually what we find is that take the core uh, and add to it properly so that you're actually pushing the right approach within your organization. So don't never, never embrace it as a product. We, I remember there was a, um, a recent project I was involved in where the manager was asking their internal team, so uh, you guys have been doing that for maybe three months. I'm guessing it's all working now, right? <laughs> and uh, the poor engineering team behind that were like, yeah, but that, it's not just installing VMware. You know, like it, it has to really um, be leveraged for our environment, for our organization, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, so the management did not understand that for them it was just implementation of a product. And they didn't really get the fact that it's evolving, it's moving fast, there's a new release every six months, and it's quite different every time. So that also creates a level of risk and uh, challenges within the organizations where you need to always stay on top of things. You need to have um, the proper processes and in, inside in place, like a CI CD automation, so on. I'll, I'll get to that. But these allow you to leverage that properly and simplify your job, right? Another thing, uh, don't try to do it alone. Reach out to the community, get involved in the community, get work with uh, members or vendors or people, uh, your favorite partner. Uh, the worst thing you wanna do is uh, just say, okay, I'll download it and I'll, I'll give it a shot. Because as any open source project, the documentation is, uh, pretty bad, getting better, but it, it is quite terrible. Um, and so you need to be working with the people that are writing the code, the people that are committers to these projects, the people that are doing that from a day-to-day -day perspective. Uh, so I encourage you to be talking with any other community, your favorite community members uh, that mostly are speakers uh, this week, or feel free to reach out. People are nice, people will help you, and uh, um, that's also very useful. You can also use system integrators in some cases to help you even more. So 
Uh, most of the time, uh, system integrators will do a bit of the legwork, but just be careful and to just not, um, uh, you'll want to have a bit of a, an internal knowledge, uh, just offloading it to your SI. Sometimes can be a good bootstrap strategy or something to get started with. But as the project evolves and matures and so on, keeping on top of things makes you kind of dependent on the SI for, for quite a long time. So I always encourage people to know how to fish uh, instead of just getting the fishes from their SI. Um, another thing, please don't fork the code base. Uh, that is probably one of the worst things you can do from an open daylight perspective. If you are forking or doing an internal fork, by the time you're done doing your project, the technical debt that you will have acquired will be so, um, because of the number of committers, we have 900 committers to Open Daylight today. So because of the number of committers to the project and the rate of change, that means that the technical debt is moving very, very fast. So the best way is really to um, ingest the upstream, make some downstream additions and gate it in a proper process. You don't want to be just taking, uh, taking open daylight, a snapshot day one, and then forking it, building your product or solution. That's definitely not uh, the way you want to do it. You want to have a continuous feedback loop with uh, the, the community or the master branches with the current releases so that, yes, you will have the ability to, to leverage that, but um, you will not be amassing that level of technical debt. Finally, uh, you need to automate your solution. You can either do it in-house or turn to people like us uh, if you want uh, that will help you leverage that. Uh, we do it through our platform in our case, but otherwise, automate it in-house. Put your CICD hat on, uh, automate the whole end-to-end -end because if you're trying to do this by hand, like I was saying earlier, um, just merging inside the, the rate of daily, daily rate of change of the project, getting that um, uh, back it makes it very, very impossible to, uh, to manage. I've seen many people fail over the past three years just because they were not automating it properly and usually forking it at the same time. So these go into in hand. Yes? Um, mm, yeah, I'd say nine months. Yeah, yeah. That's my guesstimate. Um, a nine months timeline is good. Usually you'll have like a first three month phase uh, that's more like kicking the tires, then the second pre prod, and then uh, it goes in production after, yeah, afterwards. Um, so, yeah, nine, nine months would be a. Uh, Accurate. Of course, it depends on the, what you're actually doing from a use case perspective and the size of the company. Uh, larger operators uh, takes more time, um, but I'm, I'm telling you more of the average uh, folk. Uh, if you look at uh, some of the vendor work we've done, where we actually have products that are kind of OEM, like use our Open Daylight as an OEM a solution. Um, so these were more towards like the six months period before it shipped. Um, uh, so it, uh, it was more of a, you know, time to market was a little critical there. So six months. Uh, so three months of implementation, four, four months of hardening, testing, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what we find. So Thank you, folks. I hope this helped a bit on some of the topics. Uh, however, like now I invite you to ask any relevant questions that you may have. Uh, on. Yes? Yeah, that, that is a good point. Um, so let, let, let me rephrase that because the, the, you know, how the session is laid out, you know, how it's titled. Mm -hmm. um, when I talk to an executive about doing something, they see the big picture and want to want to do everything. Mm -hmm. But how do you talk to them and say, in a modern way, you can't just go do everything at once. You need to start with the distribution. 
Yeah. No, you are. Uh, you have a good point there. Um, I have seen. Uh, I think starting big is probably one of the biggest mistakes you can do, um, especially in this. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, open daylight, uh, just because, like I said, you need to have more of an onion uh, or layered uh, approach to the problem. You don't want to just solve the uh, the end to end. What we usually like is um, solving it problem by problem and and slowly bringing it as a side system within the the environment. So I'll give you an example that we did with one of our customers is. The first thing we did is uh, we brought open daylight in, but it was, um, I'll, I'll just abstract the, the, the business case um, briefly. The idea was to optimize um, the network in order to, uh, to, to generate savings, right? So the very standard use case, I, I, uh, um, so it was an ops of the core uh, transport networks. So in the case of, uh, of that use case, people wanted to be able to optimize the internal networks, the routes and everything at the edge, and also uh, make automation end-to-end -end, uh, within the core trans uh, optical and, and transport networks. So what we did is, because it's critical infrastructure, the first phase there was more of an observer phase. Okay, so. The first phase is we brought open daylight in production as an observer. So it, what it was doing is it was not automating, it was just ingesting and then giving insight to the network engineers. I know it's kind of a, um, useless, but it actually allowed the network, some of the network engineers to get familiar with, um, uh, with the tool and the type of information that the tool knew about, okay? And then the second phase is where we added the uh, more of the automation or the config rules that, that were changed. So we ran Open Daylight in parallel. Uh, it was getting all the data and then informing the network engineer, this is what I would do as a change. This is like this my uh, config management template that I plan that I would apply on the network elements. Um, so that look at it like as the proposed Yang model or pro in the case of that uh, particular use case, it was a netconf thing. So that's my proposed netconf model that's going out. So then the network engineer was the one applying it. Uh, so through a script or CI CD or just approving it at least. Um, and then so that was the first phase. When they were secured, when they had confidence into open daylight making the right config choices uh, for the environment, that, that's when they started automating uh, more uh, directly. So then Open Daylight was doing the config change. Uh, and then the last step was pretty much uh, just scaling it out, you know, like just uh, bringing uh, more devices in the picture. So that, that was like the three phases for that particular customer. And it went well uh, for that one. So just an example, uh, everyone's different, but I, I, I find that doing it by pieces uh, helps you uh, uh, be successful. Any additional questions? Yes. There is a slide where it's talking about the cases, mm -hmm. the numbers. Yeah. Uh, the service provider, the enterprise, and the research. Mm -hmm. So uh, how many cases uh, uh, in total in that uh, uh, um, The statistics was on a sample of about 200 and I think it was 274. Five or 300 uh, uh, were surveyed, the sampling of that survey. Around two, yeah, I, I think it's that uh, sample rate. Because, uh, yeah, it was the Open Daylight official survey uh, in that case. So. In this case, so uh, is this uh, all the cases? Is, uh, the, uh, do they make use of the Open Daylight in the uh, uh, <laughs> that is a good question. Uh, in this survey, it was not specified whether it was uh, experimental or production. What I can tell you based on what I know is open daylight today in production, I, I'd say there's about 200, a little more than 200 deployments in production, like various forms of production 
of open daylight today. Either most of them, though, are in derivative forms. In other words, inside a product, inside something that a vendor prepared, um, or inside a customized solution that was deployed. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't see a lot yet of, I download it and I run it and it works um, from an open daylight perspective. I, yeah, that's not, that's not quite uh, it. Uh, so just making it work, download, go on the opendaylight.org, download it, run it. That's today not really um, successful. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the numbers I'm giving you are basically the numbers we got from the aggregate uh, members of the community um, that are selling products or, um, you know, leveraging it for, for a few customers. But it, it needs a lot of hand-holding, like it, you know, they, you have people in the back making sure it works, like OpenStack, right? You, you have, yes, it's running, but don't touch it, and it, you have people behind it making sure that it's, uh, it's uh, working well. So. Spot, yep. Yeah, spot. Yep. And uh, so, uh, what kind of uh, uh, scale is the. Uh, I mean, what kind of scale is the sweet spot? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, honestly, it depends on the use case. Um, it really depends on the use case because in some cases, if you're talking about network virtualization, for example, or, you know, like comparing it to. Uh, NSX or Open Contrail or whatever you like, choose your poison on <laughs> on the uh, on the open net uh, on the network virtualization side of things. So uh, in that case, you might be running vSwitch on each server node, uh, and therefore your your scale factor for that return on investment will be different than if you're looking, for example, at an optical transport network, um, which you might have like only. 45 uh, uh, big optical devices. Um, and so from a scaling perspective, um, the sweet spot will be different and the gain will be different because on the optical network, your win is that you're kind of away from that uh, proprietary like uh, solution that your vendor sells you, that the optical vendor will sell you for you know, large, large sums. Whereas for only 42 devices, whereas uh, in the data center, you're looking at a much higher number. So there's not necessarily a, an optimal number of network elements. Uh, it really depends on the use case. Uh, however, what we found, and that's the Harwai tool that I, I'm, I was talking about, um, that helps you kind of make some of these assumptions. Um, and what we found is that uh, it has to be at least, um, uh, you, you need to have more than what two engineers would handle. Like in, in other words, if you have like a research and education networks-ish type of uh, environment with three NOC people that are just doing the best effort thing, um, there's not a lot of benefit in automating your environment. Uh, when you start having more processes in place and have um, a s certain scale, uh, then that is when you're starting to save. So I'd say uh, you need at least to have five, and five engineers or more. Uh, if you have lower than that, paying them will likely be, like paying five, pe uh, five people will cost you less than the effort of putting the system in place. Uh, but that's yeah, two, three to five people. Um, so the very small networks uh, gets a little more challenging. Any other question? No. How many of you are actually uh, using Open Daylight today? How, how what what was your experience so far? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so one of the comments you made was uh, about how the, you know, the organization needs to embrace automation. Uh, in, uh, there's a skill.
skill set that comes along with that, not just the, not just the mind shift. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, I did not mention that, but that is a significant uh, change. Is uh, and we've been doing a lot of open daylight training. And when we get a lot of the um, network engineers in our classes, the paradigm shift from you know the net the typical CLI approach to more of a DevOps uh, set of uh, Git is the <laughs> the source type of uh, behavior. Is, uh, is a challenging experience for most of them. Uh, so that is a big challenge within organizations uh, for people to really consume it and, and use it properly. Uh, any other questions? How, how many of you plan to use Open Daylight or are considering Open Daylight within your organizations? Okay, that's good. So if you have any questions, uh, you want the ROI tool or you need, to have, you need a deck to make an internal pitch, please uh, reach out and we can provide you with all the tools and ammunitions that can help you make the case within, the, uh, within your organization. It's going to be our pleasure to help you uh, move forward um, and be the champion. So thank you very much for coming to the talk and uh, looking forward uh, to you enjoying the summit. Thanks. All right, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get started. Um, so welcome to my talk. Uh, it's actually on getting approval, um, basically how to make a case for open daylight and how do you actually get executive approval within your organization. So um, I'm going to go over a variety of uh, things that should be considered, uh, what can you do, uh, we have a few tools and, and so on and so forth. Um, and before I actually do that, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Mathieu Lamey, CEO of uh, InnoSype Technologies. We're a pure play open daylight company. So we've been involved in the project since its uh, inception. So we've been very, um, uh, we saw all the iterations uh, and how it actually evolved over time. And we're aware of the good, the bad, and, uh, and the actual ugly. Uh, however, uh, open daylight has been uh, uh, deployed in, in production uh, more and more over the past, I'd say, last two, three releases, we, we're seeing more and more uh, real use cases. Uh, we're helping vendors do products out of it and so on and so forth. Um, therefore, it gets into um, uh, more of the budgetary discussions. It gets down to how, like, Where's, where's the money that I will save? What's the ROI? Why should we even go with that open source thing versus buying from their typical proprietary vendors? So that's why the business case and the actual savings, whether it's um, saving on the core network costs and through, through optimization by doing different types of flow management, or uh, it's actually just lowering the capex costs and so on. Uh, you need to have a strategy in order to make money. Just checking what it can do cannot um, solve it. So what, what are the common business cases, or what, which ones do we see the most often? Um, we'd say that in the cloud environments, uh, or in the data center slash cloud use cases, um, most of the business case is uh, geared towards a lower capex. So they will want, or most folks, wants to lower uh, the cost of the gear that they're using because it's a massive scale data center environment. Therefore, the cost per port uh, becomes significant. We believe it's important to know exactly how one should be making the case uh, for proper approval uh, within the organization. I'm hoping to make this session uh, a bit interactive as well. I mean, so if you guys uh, have any questions, comments, are living some of uh, the issues yourselves, uh, I would love to hear you out and potentially give you any guidance I can uh, in order to help you um, may be the champion within your organization. So how do you actually start into um, uh, bringing open daylight in uh, your organization? Well, the, the first thing you need to come up with, I know it sounds obvious, but it has to come up with a, 
a strategy on how you will bring that internally. Um, you need to really design how you will be making the case, how you will be getting the proper approval, the proper budgets, and so on and so forth, uh, in order to address that. So I'll, I'll go into details on, on why um, and, and how it starts. So the first thing, it actually starts with a champion, and most likely the champion is you. Um, uh, all the polls in order to... Um, to make it happen and of course have access to the budgets. I know it kind of is the 101 and it's, uh, it's quite obvious, but I, I just wanted to lay it out there. Um, of course, it will take lots of preparation. It's going to be a, a bumpy ride and you will have to be the go-to person. You need to be ready for the changes and you need to be able to fight with the processes that um, will, like, will be in either your procurement or some of the pr procurement challenges uh, where they will basically steer you to uh, either your typical vendor or an alternative solution or just getting into the whole PO process sometimes will be uh, uh, quite challenging. And so what we find is what helps, and again, I apologize if that sounds like 101, but it's really to start with a business case. Too often do we see people just kicking the tires to understand the technology and, and know what to do with it. Um, usually that doesn't end up well uh, because when it, <laughs> the champion uh, has to learn everything about uh, open daylight before the others. So you need to be able to digest everything you learn uh, around, the, uh, around the framework. We, what we saw in the, um, the engagements is there's always that one key person that everyone refers to. And that person is the one that will have to roll the boulder uphill uh, within the organization. I know it's not easy. Uh, for most people we've been working with, it's always a huge um, internal debate, a lot of internal politics and so on and so forth, uh, and that's why you guys are important. Um, you also need to have great communication skills, right? Uh, usually what we find is like the deep technical people that know a lot about ODL or, or that have all the, the right knowledge sometimes will fail into getting the executive approval uh, required because of some communication uh, or more politics challenges within the organization. So communication skills are uh, essential. You need to have the right influence and reputation within the organization. So if it's not you, you basically need to have 